This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm not a huge fan of the cult of Silicon Valley. Me either. Um, you know, I think that having some distance from the yep. cult yep. Um, gives you the ability to make some really good decisions. I'm still a huge fan of bootstrapping. You know, I mean, businesses have been grown for hundreds of years without right. the world of VC. It's a relatively modern phenomenon. There are great companies out there that are built to $1 million in revenue, $5 million, $10 million, maybe mm -hmm. $20 million in revenue. And the large majority of those, um, I think, are better run as, as bootstrapped or very low capitalized uh, businesses. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my God, this is like my chance. Quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. Welcome to the fifth installment of the 2015 Fall Edition of the UC Santa Barbara Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have Daryl Bernstein with us here tonight. Daryl is a serial entrepreneur. I love serial entrepreneurs that can knock it out in the same space over and over and over again. I respect those people, but Daryl's knocked it out in two spaces that are completely unrelated, and I think that is a true sign of entrepreneurship. Daryl is also an author. Um, he's his, he has focused on children's literature or entrepreneurship for children, and he's actually been recognized by the global, as a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum, which I think is pretty cool, and we'll ask him a little bit about what that really means. Daryl's latest project is Right Signature, which was recently acquired by Citrix, my alma mater, public company that acquired Daryl's company um, a few months ago. And before that, he, he um, created a company from his kitchen table called Global Video, which was also acquired by a public company, um, in this case, School Specialty. Let's welcome Daryl to our class. Woo! That got me excited. Me too. Can we do that again? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Second I, time better than the first. <laughs> yes, it usually is. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about global video. So it's very different from Right Signature, which we'll also talk about, um, but very different. And I understand you were 12 years old when you first had that idea and you first, it sort of ideated. Talk to me about that time between 12 and 17, 18, 19, and then how much progress did you make on the idea and then obviously as you matured and you end up selling that business. I'd love to just hear, these folks are a little bit older than 12 and most of the people that are watching this are slightly older than 12. So take us through that process. So I was a weird kid. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. It's a disclaimer. Um, I actually uh, became interested in business when I was probably seven or eight years old. Uh, definitely a little bit unusual. My friends were riding bikes around the neighborhood and I was reading the Wall Street Journal. Um, I actually couldn't afford a subscription to the Wall Street Journal so I actually convinced my neighbor across the street who was a, an older guy who got the newspaper uh, every morning to, to let me read it, but the deal was that I had to get it folded back up perfectly nice. and inserted back in the plastic wrap before he woke up. Wow. Uh, so seven or eight years old, I was getting up at 4.30 to take his Wall Street Journal off his driveway and uh, uh, do my, my hour and a half of reading before he, he got up See for how coffee. behind you guys are? That's right. It's hopeless. Right. Just stop now. Wow. I started early. I didn't know uh, that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah I started really early. So. Um, I, uh, I love the idea of finding, kind of identifying needs um, and thinking about uh, what businesses might be created around those simple needs. Right. Um, you know, somebody would say like, I wish my sweater was warmer. And I'd always say, how much would you pay for a warmer sweater, right? <laughs> um, so, so I was, uh, you know, really an inquisitive kid that way. And um, starting when I was, uh, I guess, 12 years old, uh, my dad was a French professor and a high school French mm. teacher. Um, and great teacher, brilliant, just super passionate, loved students, spent all of his time on stage and really creative activities, but he'd just come home exhausted. Yep. And, uh, I can relate to that. Yeah, right? you know what that's like. Um, so 12, you know, 12 years old, I'm home, and one night I see him flipping through a, a, a phone book that he had uh, found, I guess, in Paris, or, 
And I asked him, uh, what are you looking for? You know, he's flipping through and he said, you know, I had this idea that if I could find some really great French films, I would like to show that to my class because uh -huh. it would really, you know, enrich the experience and give yep. me some time off stage yep. um, and so on. And, and you so didn't use Netflix because? This was uh, 1989, no, believe it or I not. Just, um, put it in context. Pre-Netflix. Pre and um, so, of course, as I usually did, I said, how much would you pay for the right, uh, the right French film? Um, we talked about it a little bit and what the need was. And so I went to work uh, figuring out where we could find these types of things that a French teacher might want and wow. located some, uh, some product. And um, my dad bought the first copy, of course. <laughs> um, and I, I found some distributors and I, I made a deal for the first one. I was 12 years old, you know, on the phone with, with France initially and then French speaking Canada. Uh, cutting deals. I said, well, if we bought, you know, 10 copies of this film, what would the price be? And if I bought 100 copies, what would the price so be? So you were a multilingual entrepreneur at 12? Uh, all in English, all in English, oh, okay. which, which was a problem in some, some, of these, <laughs> in some of these conversations. Long story short, uh, I, I sent out some, I made some brochures and uh, sent it out to a handful of French teachers thinking, well, if my dad needs this, probably other French teachers yep, do. Yep. Um, and a week later, went to the, to the P.O. box, opened it up, and there was a pile of checks and purchase orders from, uh, from schools. So uh, we knew we were on to something and um, it started, started sending out more of these flyers, pitching more, uh, more films, and we were importing uh, you know, videos that cost $8, we'd sell them for 50, nice. pretty simple business. Nice. Uh, I'd come home after school every day, you know, 12 years old, 13 years old, open the mailbox and pile of checks and purchase orders from schools and slowly scaling this business and expanding. I don't know why, but it took me till I was about I guess 13 or 14 to realize there might be some scalable opportunity beyond mm -hmm. uh, this nice cash flow of uh, French videos. And I thought, you know, I take Spanish in school, not French. I wonder if Spanish teachers have the same need. You know, in retrospect, it seems like an obvious uh, conclusion. Right. Come on, you uh, were like 12 years old. Uh, exactly. Give I didn't know about scalability and business models. <laughs> um, so uh, so we'd say I, put, I located some movies for Spanish teachers, sent out some flyers, orders started spilling in for Spanish teachers. So wow. uh, hired a couple of employees. We started to slowly expand this business. It took me until I was 15 years old to wake up one day and realize, I wonder if other kinds of teachers need uh, some films in their classroom. And so I identified American history as the next mm -hmm. uh, potential area. We actually put together a nice selection of videos from uh, you know, major producers, sent out a catalog. I prayed a little bit, opened the <laughs> mailbox a week later, more orders spilling wow. in. Um, so we realized we were really onto something. And uh, Let me stop you for a second. It, Tell me about these employees, because I'm trying to picture like this 13, 14 year old Daryl, like were you ordering around adults or was it other kids? Or? No, this was, this was uh, we, we started hiring adults. I needed people to fill orders, answer the phones. Uh, you know, yeah. And they're like, where's your dad? And you're yeah. like, no, 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 I'm the guy. It was all me. And luckily um, my, my dad was part of the business and, and actually uh, ended up a couple years later retiring to help me run the business. Oh, and okay. I was having trouble uh, conversations with bankers, so I didn't have a beard yet. <laughs> um, we were having issues, uh, you know, getting a credit line and leasing right. a building. Landlords are not too uh, open to leasing right. to 14 to <laughs> yeah, uh, some things like that. So uh, needless to say, we worked really hard though. I mean, you know, 18 hours a day, I would go to school uh, till, you know, three oh, o'clock wow. and then work till two or three in the morning and, uh, you know, learning everything. And I didn't have the benefit that all, all you have uh, learning from John and uh, all the great resources you have now, but entrepreneurship and, you know, learning uh, all the pieces of what we did. I had no clue. You know, right. it was all trial by fire. Uh, lost money trying different things. Didn't know anything about advertising. Didn't know anything about talking to customers. Um, you know, we had to learn from, from, from ground zero. Wow. Um, so uh, great, great experience though. So how did you, so now I'm really scratching my head. So how did you find time to write books about entrepreneurship as a teenager? And tell me about that, that focus. So you're running around, you're running the company, you're staying up till two, three in the morning. Then you're like, oh, and I should write a book about it. And then you start writing this book. Simon & Schuster publishes it. Like what was that journey like? So there was actually an interesting story. It was a little bit of a gap in the video business where um, I hadn't quite realized the scalability and I was getting really tired staying up till 3 a.m. packing yeah. boxes with videos. Right. Um, even though the checks were really nice coming in the mailbox <laughs> and uh, I was looking, looking for something else. And my friends, of course, were fascinated with, you know, all this entrepreneurship stuff that I was trying and always asking, you know, what could I do? Um, and so I started jotting down a lot of these ideas that mm. I'd spotted all over the place, mm. uh, the, the warm sweaters and the, right. uh, you know, a little, little notepad. And I eventually turned that into uh, to a book for, for kids, really, on, on entrepreneurship. That was right. a, just a huge passion for me and seemed to be interesting to other young people. Um, the book has interestingly gone on to kind of become a, 
a perennial you know, bestseller in the little mini genre of kids entrepreneurship. And nice. I still get letters from kids all over the world oh, saying, nice. yeah, I started this, I started that. And I even occasionally run into adults now that go, oh, I, didn't, I didn't realize you wrote, you know, wrote that book. That was actually what started me in, wow. in the path of business or entrepreneurship. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a neat story. So did that lead to your recognition then? Um, or was there, were there, was there other involvement for, for your recognition as, as your focus on juvenile or youth um, entrepreneurship. Yeah, that, that was really meaningful. I think it struck a lot, of, a lot of chords. So schools started carrying the book, and ah, it, it okay. got more and more attention, and led to the you know, Switzerland Award You thing, and various various things you know spilled in. It was really a new era. You know, we live. You all are really fortunate, I think, to live in the startup era, the era of TechCrunch and Hacker News, and right. uh, you know. A Y Combinator and all the wonderful things that support the startup, you know, ecosystem. Videos like this, and people all over the world watch these videos. You, you got it. They, they, they now have resources that they didn't when when you published. Absolutely. Your book. I mean, it's the idea of startups and entrepreneurship as a career was uh, right. a pretty new thing. Right. So that's very cool. So, yeah. do you have a third book in your future? I know you're a bit busy right now. We're going to talk about that, but. Do you have another book in your future? I, I've been so busy for so many years, uh, no immediate plans to write it, um, but I've got lots of ideas. I've learned you know, so much in the right. decade or so since I, or longer since I wrote the, uh, the last book, so I'll try to give you some of the best uh, strategies Good. here today. Good, all right, and we'll look forward to, because I think you do have a future book in your, I think you do have a book in your future. We're gonna go to you in one minute, just on the next question. Um, so I wanted to put money in this guy's company, by the way. And so I don't hold a grudge. Look at this. I'm not vindictive. Right. Yep. Um, just to, except that I will publicly announce that I did want to put money in your business. I met Daryl, and I knew. I mean, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, and it was it was clear to me that this guy's a winner. It was clear to me this guy was going to be successful. And this was in the very early stages of Right Signature. Right. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about both of your businesses were bootstrapped. Both of your business, and what, just to clarify, both of, he grew his companies organically through customer dollars, which is, I think, the best way to do it. Yep. And I think we've had that conversation um, near the end, which was, and I've certainly had it with other entrepreneurs, if you can grow your business at a rate that you're comfortable with and you're not going to get overtaken by somebody else, then you should use customer dollars. They taste, they taste great, there's no dilution, and they're going to give you honest and open feedback because they're paying, paying you. Now that you've gone through that journey twice, what advice might you have for someone else that cons that's considering taking outside capital, be it venture or be it angel or whatever? What are the pros and cons that you've seen now that you've, you've done it twice? So I'm a huge fan of bootstrapping. Yep. Um, the first time I did it was because I didn't know anything else existed. Right, I didn't know right. you could raise investor money. I, and you were 14. Nobody's going to give a 14-year-old kid that's money. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, Second time, I had a lot more knowledge, um, but I'm still a huge fan of bootstrapping. You know, I mean, businesses have been grown for hundreds of years without right. the world of VC. It's a relatively modern phenomenon, and right. for certain kinds of businesses, um, I think VC capital can be can be a, a good fit. But I think there's a huge disconnect right now. We're seeing it with unicorns. Yeah, this ridiculous. idea that that every business has the potential to be a 500 million or yep. billion dollar revenue business. Yep. You know, the large majority of businesses in the world, there are great companies out there that are built to 1 million in revenue, 5 million, 10 million, maybe mm -hmm. 20 million in revenue. And the large ma majority of those, um, I think, are better run as as bootstrapped or very low capitalized. Uh, businesses. So I think it's really important for the entrepreneur to really be honest and look at the model. Um, yeah. If you really are sitting on an idea that you think is the next Facebook or, or Tesla, by all means, go out and raise a ton exactly. of money. Right. Um, but for the large majority of models out there, there you, you can build a very nice business and not not be a Facebook outcome um, and, and bootstrap the whole thing. Yeah. I also think from a discipline point of view, uh, bootstrapping forces you to really make good decisions. Yeah. Uh, you've got no ability to um, uh, you know, to burn fat. And I often uh, compare, you know, strapping on a bootstrap, uh, kind of a, a bootstrap business or taking a bootstrap business, trying to turn it into a VC business. If you don't have a really tight ship, it's like, it's like a, a speedboat. Um, it's like putting a rocket on the back of a, of a leaky rowboat. Mm -hmm. You know, you can really have a mess on your hands if you take a business that's not fully stabilized with a really great model, great team, yep. um, and put a bunch of money into it. And we, we see that a lot. Yeah, I mean, so. you get, you actually, the pressure mounts. As soon as you take money from, especially from venture capitalists, the pressure mounts to spend that money. Absolutely. As opposed to taking a measured approach and, and really making sure that the, every dollar you spend, it's sort of counterintuitive. You'd think that the people giving you the money wouldn't be put pressuring you to spend it, but they do. In fact, um, and so I, I, I've always respected that. We have Dan Engel in the audience. Dan is also a bootstrapper. He's built some very sizable companies through customer dollars. I think it requires you to be more clever. I think it requires you to be more creative. It certainly gives you greater control over your business. Um, and you have to be honest with yourself as an entrepreneur and, and say, do I want venture capital money because I think that's what I should do? Because I think it'll look good in TechCrunch? Because my friends did it? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, seriously, I mean, a lot of people raise money because they think that's a milestone that they should um, go forth, whereas that's the wrong way to look at it. You raise money if you've sat down and been honest with yourself and said, the incremental growth I'm going to get from this capital is going to exceed the dilution and, and, and control issues that I'm going to face. I, I agree. Like completely. Uber or something. I mean, if you've got a huge opportunity that's going to require you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, of course, you make that decision. But most businesses, I, I agree with Daryl, I think most businesses don't, quote, need venture capital. Many of them benefit from venture capital. So you have to decide which, you know, which bucket you fall Agreed. into. It's become a uh, the sort of common expectation that every tech company right. should be, uh, it's venture should be funded. Why aren't you venture back? That's like, right. As if there was something wrong with it. It's that's like, right. Well, it's, because it's, it's certainly one path. I also sure. think that's to do with the fit of the entrepreneur and yep. the team that's involved. Because uh, you're running a VC-backed company. I've been on the other side of the table as an investor in VC-backed companies. A small VC-backed company is like a mini public company. It mm -hmm. operates on quarterly results, yep. quarterly goals, financial expectations. Um, and if you've got the right team together and that's the kind of path you want to take, by all means, you know, go do it. But I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, and especially young entrepreneurs, those of you thinking of starting companies, you know, if you can take something small and work it yourself, the learning experience um, and the flexibility you have to navigate, make decisions, you know, change along the way, it's unrivaled when you're doing it yourself. Yep. Uh, and if you happen to hit a home run and you find somebody that's really successful and you build a business that you own, you want to own for a long time, now you're in control. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. the other difference is you're going to have a forced exit at some point that's if you right. have investors because, you know, and that's part of the deal is you take money with the expectation that you're going to return capital. Correct. Whereas if you own the business 100%, like when Daryl sold his company to Citrix, you had that choice. Nobody was forcing your hand. Nobody was going to veto the price. It was up to you and, you know, your constituents, your, your shareholders, your, your employees. But it was largely up to you as opposed to uh, an investor who's looking for a return. That's right. Let's take the first student question. Okay, so after doing some research and looking at your Twitter, I noticed you have significantly fewer posts than most entrepreneurs. Uh, what's your opinion on social networking and its effect on business etiquette? So uh, social networking in general is amazing. Um, but again, same answer I have for VC funding, right? Where you, there's only so much time in the day where you're going to spend your time. Um, in my business, I'm heavily involved in B2B SaaS. Um, our customers are small businesses, and there's a lot better ways for me personally to spend my, my limited hours in the day. So it's like one of those things like VC funding. Uh, does everybody need to do it? Absolutely not. If it fits your model and your business, uh, if you're a consumer-oriented business, you're doing consumer products, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of other reasons why social media can be great if you're building a personal brand. Um, you know, if you're looking to build your career around your personal brand, there's a lot of great reasons to be uh, dedicating time there. For me personally, uh, I'm more focused on the business. And you'll see that with a number of entrepreneurs. Their, their company might have a large Twitter following, but personally, you know, they don't necessarily have yep. that. And it's, it's a lot of it's because of time, you know, it's time um, return on your investment of your time. It's like, yeah, I can get more Twitter followers, but I'm probably going to do better by my company if I, if I spend a little bit more time thinking about pricing or customers. Absolutely. So you mentioned as an investor, um, I mentioned in my intro that you are a very successful investor, including MindBody, which is a company that um, recently went public Correct. and has done quite well. When you're assessing entrepreneurs such as those that are in this room and watching um, out there, what are the characteristics you're looking for um, when you're, you know, it, it's very difficult. It's almost like a job interview. You have a limited amount of time. You're not going to spend months with these people to vet them. You're, you're writing a relatively small check, so, you, so it doesn't make sense to spend forever on it. Um, sort of what, I'd love to hear some of your ideas on characteristics of entrepreneurship, and are there deal breakers? Are there things you hear and you're like, okay, this isn't for me. It might still be a good deal. It might be a good deal for someone else, but not for me. So I actually write very, very few checks uh -huh. compared to most investors. So to me, if I'm putting some of my personal assets into a company, it's got to be, uh, I have a very high bar. It's yep. got to be something I really believe in. And in fact, the question I ask myself is, uh, you know, would I, is this opportunity strong enough that I'd be willing to drop everything else I'm doing uh. and put the large majority of my net worth into supporting this company? Would I be willing to be the CEO of this company? Would I be willing to clear everything else off my plate, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very high bar. So um, a lot of investors, when you're operating from portfolio theory, it's, I'll scatter a little bit here, a little bit there. These yep. nice guys. This looks like a good opportunity. They've got a bunch of Twitter followers, you know, <laughs> a few different characteristics. I'll, I'll write a small check and right. hope for the best. Right. Um, and, you know, portfolio theory works for some investors. For me, I'd rather uh, pick very few. If, you know, you have a, uh, for me, it takes a long time to kind of reload the cannon. I have a couple big shots. Sure. Um, I really like to concentrate, uh, you know, on those shots. So yep. that being said, when I look at the entrepreneurs, to me, uh, great entrepreneurs come down to decision making. 
Um, and not to pick on the, the Twitter example, but there's, there's only so much time in the day and there's a ton of opportunities when you start a business. Yep. You can, uh, you know, you're gonna have people come at you from all directions saying, how about this and partner with me that and have you tried doing this and have you tried displaying it over there and to go to this trade show and talk to this journalist and yep. come talk to John. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of different opportunities on the table and entrepreneurship is all about decision making. Mm -hmm. It's figuring out what, you know, what's important, where are you going, having that intuition to kind of stick with it. So that's a tough thing to judge yep. um, in, in anybody, whether you're earlier in your career or a successful entrepreneur. So, you know, I always try to ask people about their, um, their life history, their business history. You know, tell me about the, uh, the two or three most difficult decisions you made in your business or your life mm -hmm. and, and, you know, how you went through the process and, and how you got there. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you see a lot of people that have trouble prioritizing. You see a lot of people that, um, you know, come in with kind of cognitive biases. Um, you know, into decision making. You see a lot of people that are, are kind of so heavy on intuition that they don't take in uh, mm -hmm. all the data that's, right. that may be presenting a decision. You see a lot right. of people that'll make a decision but then kind of refuse to re-examine it and figure yeah. out. And so that balance between being able to kind of take in all the metrics, um, you know, take your intuition into a situation, make firm decisions but be willing to re-examine and admit you made mistakes and change the course of the boat down the road. That, that proper balance is what separates you know, the, yeah. the Steve Jobs and the Elon Musk from right. uh, the large majority of entrepreneurs. Yep, yep. I mean, you certainly see that in Bezos where you know, you, he's, I'm, I'm going to bastardize what he said, but it's basically be adamant and be ready to change your opinion exactly. on the drop of a hat. And, you, and that's a tough one because some people can be adamant and some people can change their opinion every five minutes, but knowing when that's to right. do it judiciously. I don't, this, this may not be a fair question because it was a number of years ago, but do you remember in your conversations with Mind Body, like what, what sort of got you excited? Was it something that they specifically said or how did they demonstrate this ability to prioritize and really to decide what not to do? That's the hardest thing as an entrepreneur is not what to do, but what not to do. Would you, so, do you remember so, it? It was a while ago. I actually do remember. Okay. Um, so Rick, the founder of Mind Body, was a former submarine captain. Ah. Um, and as a result, extremely tactical, which I loved. Yes. Um, and he showed me spreadsheets like I had never seen before. And this was to analyze at the time a very small business with yep. 20 or 30 employees. Yep. Um, but what I loved about the business is they had a very clear and realistic view of the growth potential. Um, nothing annoys me as much as a, as a startup entrepreneur with something very small who's pitching me a billion dollar outcome. Right. Um, in fact, I just turned down one the other day. That was a, really a two smart guys, um, decent team. I really liked the space, um, but they said, we're going to IPO in five years. You know, I appreciate the optimism. I, I, I truly <laughs> do. But, uh, you know, there's a reality to business. That, and, and there's, right. yeah, again, certain kinds of models that can be sky high. There's certain kinds of models that are meant to be, uh, you know, smaller, mid-sized companies. And so yeah. Rick, with MindBody early on, they were making software for yoga studios. Yep. It's a market I understood I entirely. Yeah. Uh, the numbers were small and understandable. They really understood their market, had a great product, um, but they had some ideas for scalable growth. It was a little bit like my video company. They said, you know, we're just starting to sell some of the same software to Pilates studios, but we have an idea that it might also work for gyms. Mm -hmm. And if it works for gyms, we think it might work for spas. Mm -hmm. And if we can make spas work, maybe we can make salons work, but very realistic. And they were able to early on say, you know, we think we can get the business to here. Mm -hmm. If we tweak some knobs, maybe we can get it to here. If we really have a home run and things really start to click and the landscape, the market landscape remains the way we think it is and cloud adoption you know, happens, yep. um, we can get to here, here, and here, here. That's the kind of model and kind of tactical, you know, realistic thinking that I like. And they were able to execute on that over a number of years and just continue to kind of expand and find the new market. Yep. Um, that thesis played out perfectly. Yeah, they were an overnight success, seven, eight years in the that's making, right. as it always is. I think that's why you and I, um, get along so well we're both ta i think we're both tacticians i mean I'm, we're certainly we we have a bit of strategy in our dna as well but we're very um, very very good at the tactical correct um and at execution and you're definitely good at executing let's take two student questions in a row oh my um so when in 2009 when right signature was founded the idea was kind of ahead of its time so how were when did you come up with that idea and then launch it then also, how were you able to see this kind of future market potential? I know we just touched on it right now. Yeah. So, uh, Right Signature was actually born uh, about a quarter mile that way in the uh, UCSB gymnastics uh, gym. Um, I, I was actually in an investment. Although they stage. have no rights to the idea. That's right, at, at all. No, this was a purely observational it was in the on a Saturday. Lot. That's right, in a, in a friendly conversation. <laughs> Um, so I was uh, investing at the time and, and really getting anxious to get my hands dirty again in a, in a business. And you know, as, as you all do, talking, watching for opportunities, talking to a lot of people, watching for the needs. Um, I had a friend who had developed a very basic prototype of Right Signature. At the time, it was called Right Pact. 
And he said, you know, what do you think about this? You know, look, you can, like, you can sign a contract online. And I thought about it. Said, I, you know, this, this could be pretty handy. I can see that making sense. Went home, did my own research, found out that he had not invented this idea. It had actually been around for a bunch of years. Yep. Um, and in fact, the legislation around e-signatures and signing things online was passed in, in 2000, almost a decade before, but it hadn't really taken off. So of course, I asked myself, well, why are we still faxing documents back and forth if this is legal and it's uh, you know, fully substantiated? Um, so did my, you know, did my homework. Uh, took a look again at this product that he had developed. Um, in all fairness, it was pretty crappy. Um, so I knew we'd have to kind of take the idea and, and start over again. But there was a genesis of something there. So dug into the market. We ended up launching this, this small company from day one. And it's the hardest thing in the world to start a company from ground zero. Um, you know, for those of you thinking about your careers, there's a lot to be said for joining a company that's <laughs> already got funding or right. you know, has some momentum. There's some great companies in town. Yeah. Um, if you're going to start your own thing from ground zero, you've got to be in for, for a hell of a ride. Um, and it, it takes time. It takes time to work out the details. So we rebuilt the product from ground zero. Um, we were able to get one mention in TechCrunch, uh, which brought in the first 600 or so signups, the large majority of which were junk. Uh, mm -hmm. We combed through and found the first 20 or so legit looking users. And I called them myself um, and said, what do you think of the product? Half of them said, I don't know. You know I logged in and logged out. Oh, I just saw it on TechCrunch, yeah. whatever. You know, a few of them said, oh, this, I think this could be really useful in my business. And I said, how much would you pay for it? And they said, oh, nothing. I mean, it's not that useful. Um, it, it took me another six months and a lot of phone calls to convince one person to give me a credit card for $14 a month uh, for the product. So you know, there's a long learning curve yeah. uh, figuring yeah. out what people need and you know, what fits in the market. And it helps, of course, to have the wind at your back. I was lucky in both my video business and in Right Signature to pick markets that were large enough uh, to have a tremendous opportunity for our company, but not so large that there were you know, really, really massive players coming in. Right. It's also a matter of timing. So we rode the video wave as uh, videos were expanding into classrooms. Um, obviously, the Right Signature wave was about you know, online documents becoming kind of the norm and obviously paper becoming antiquated. So, it, you know, you've got to make great decisions. You've got to build a great business, bring on the right team. Everything's still got to be done well, but it sure helps when you have the oh, wind yeah. at your back in the right market. Absolutely. And I'm actually going to jump in and then I'll get to you next because my question is sort of related. Um, so you, there were other players in the market. Okay, there was um, Jason Lemkin, who's a friend of mine now. He ended up being one of your primary competitors Absolutely. Um, with EchoSign. And then there was VeriSign, and there was others, right? There was a couple other players. So how, when you're sitting there, and I get this from students all the time, they'll say, oh, I had this great idea, and then I went on Google, and there's four companies doing it. Well, you can imagine what my response is. Mm -hmm. It's probably very similar to yours. When you, when you looked at the market and said, yeah, there's a couple people doing it. They're not dumb. Jason Lemkin's turned out to be a very successful entrepreneur. Very smart guy. What, without putting words in your mouth, what was your thought process? And ultimately, what was your biggest competition at the end of the day? So I love competitors. Sure. Um, first of all, from a startup point of view, I never want to go into a market where there aren't established players. Yep. Um, I love the idea of being number two or number three. And again, this goes back to what we talked about in the very beginning. If you want to invent a space, go out and raise $100 million, really swing for the fences, I'll watch you from the sidelines. <laughs> um, from a much more realistic point of view is finding a market you like that you're yep. really interested in. Maybe there's one or two players there that suck, yep. and you can come in and really do some disruption and build a nice business. I mean, all the things that you guys take for granted today uh, were all built in markets that already existed, right? Facebook didn't invent social media. They were about number five or something in the oh, space. Yeah. Um, you well, know, you can look at that across every like major player Media. talk about. I think GoToMedia was like the That's 80th. example. The 80th. Uh, way to meet online. It That's wasn't right. the first, second, third, or fourth. It's very rare that the first or even second player are the one that blows the market open. It happens once in a while, sure. but, but it's, it's rare. So I love to be on the coattails of other people that are spending tons of money to establish a space and do the really hard work. Right. Um, and that was very much what was going on in the electronic signature space. So we took a look at the market. There was one extremely heavily VC-backed company. Um, then Jason's company was the second, mm -hmm. uh, also took some VC funding. Those guys were working really, really hard up in the Bay Area, and I loved it. Yep. Um, and we, we rode those coattails as the market was expanding. And because it was a very early market, they were spending a lot of money and right. a lot of sweat and a lot of sleepless nights convincing people that electronic signatures were legal and showing companies how they could be used and getting the brand names and the word out there. We were, to some extent, sitting back in the wings, working yep. on what I felt were the foundational pieces. So while they, they, those guys were out promoting heavily, we were building the best product in the market. Uh, you know, we were building a really solid brand. We mm -hmm. were building the team to support it so that as the market opened up, we were there to take a, a solid share of it. So you were drafting 
and you know, anyone that's raced or rides bikes or whatever, you understand the concept mm -hmm. of drafting, which is you let the person in front of you do the really hard work, which is breaking the wind, right? That's right. And you're just sort of staying in their draft, not letting them get too far ahead because yeah. then you'll never catch up. Correct. But not worrying about overtaking them because you're getting the benefit. I think you, I think you work like 25% less, burn 25% less energy when you're drafting somebody in front of you on a bike. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I watched you guys do that. I knew Jason at the time, I didn't know him as well as I do now. Mm -hmm. And I thought he did a he did a brilliant job, and you guys did a brilliant job of being a fast follower. You both got good exits. Now, one thing that Jason said is um, he said many things. He's a prolific blogger. You guys should all be reading um, Jason Saster blog. Um, but one thing he said is it's difficult to build a SaaS business if you don't sell to the enterprise, which which means if you're not selling to larger companies with longer sales cycles as opposed to just selling online. How did you guys address that reality or do you not agree with that sentiment? So um, I love Jason's blog. I completely disagree with that particular sense. <laughs> of the case. Um, Jason's got some great arguments, great lessons. Yep. Uh, that particular one I don't agree with. So they, they built uh, that competitor heavily on enterprise. Interestingly, we built entirely selling to small businesses. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that uh, you have to sell software to enterprises as a general comment. There are uh, a lot of great businesses built, including GoToMeeting on, uh, on SMB. MindBody was built entirely on right. small mom and pop uh, yep. yoga studios, gym salons, right? Signature was built serving small businesses. And Folio to some extent. Absolutely. Yeah. And frankly, at the end of the day, if I had a choice of uh, owning a company or running a company that had 10,000 tiny customers versus 10 huge ones, I'll take the 10,000 tiny ones any day of the week, right? Yep. Because yep. Uh, frankly, if you upset a few of them, not the end of the world. You've got right. 9,997 others. Right. Um, not that you don't do, do a good job trying to, to uh, please them all. Um, but you've got a much more diversified customer base. Um, and the world is made up of small businesses. There's millions exactly. and millions and millions of them. So uh, I completely respect what, uh, what Jason built over there. But I think you know, serving consumers, prosumers, small businesses in many ways is more satisfying and, and builds a more stable asset over the long term. Well, I think it also, it's also about matching your funding strategy with your go-to-market strategy, right? So to have an enterprise sales team is expensive. You have to have a ramp up period where your enterprise salespeople are learning, they're getting their prospects all lined up and they're not selling. So, so they're inefficient effectively. And you're having to cover their cost until they become efficient. Whereas with your model, you didn't have that expense. You didn't have that burn. Jason had VC funding. He could afford to invest in people that didn't work out and kind of wait until they finally produced. Whereas you didn't have that luxury. You said, no, I've got to, I've, if I spend a buck, I got to make a buck 50 back. And so that, that piece of the model didn't work. Correct. Which I think, you know, at the end of the day, you really want your business to be fun. You yeah. know, life is yeah. short. You yes. want to do something that you love. Amen. Uh, for me, Right Signature, we help a lot of small small businesses. You know, we have veterinarians and doctors and lawyers and, and you know, regular people that every day say, this product saves my life. You mm -hmm. know, I don't have to deal with paper anymore. Yep. When I was in the video business, it was the same thing with teachers, an amazing audience that were so thankful and gracious to have this product. We yes. affected a lot of student lives. Huge impact, right? That makes me go to sleep at night, feel yep. good about what I'm doing, Likewise. come in motivated every day for the next 18 hour day. Um, if, it, uh, you know, if it rings your bell to sell to enterprises and support enterprises all day long, uh, I respect right. it. Well, and also, I think looking for that greater good in your product is really important. I think Absolutely. with GoToMeeting, you know, I've said this many times, it'll, there was a lot of soccer games that got watched, there was a lot of birthday parties that got attended because mom or dad didn't have to jump on a plane to fly to the East Coast right. and they could be there. Um, and, and the same to some extent would go to my PC where people were able to work from home. Um, and then the robotics company I did before that helped you know, advance medicine tremendously. Um, so those are things to feel good about. I think it's appropriate as an entrepreneur to feel good about those legacies. And I think I would ask all of you to look for those, look for those aspects of your ventures as well. What is the greater good that I'm bringing in addition to creating wealth for my family and my friends and the community? So there's nothing wrong with, with having both of those missions. All right, I will take two student questions this time. So you said you're a big fan of bootstrapping, and bootstrapping involves a lot of making your own decisions without the pressures and opinions of a VC company. What are some of the biggest mistakes you made early on, and what lessons can you share with the audience about bootstrapping? So I think the, the risk of bootstrapping, of course, is much more on your shoulders without that uh, idea of a board or, or experts looking over what you're doing. Um, and boards and experts can go wildly wrong, uh, just as your own judgment <laughs> can go wildly wrong. Um, I think the, the biggest mistakes I've made over the years are generally, my, my grandmother used to say to me, um, and she's the only entrepreneur in my family, by the way, I think the genes skipped a generation. Um, <laughs> She used to say to me, you know, look at what's under your nose. That was her favorite statement. Mm -hmm. You don't, you're, she, I, I'd stretch for ideas. You know, I'd say, well, Grandma, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And we could, you know, do this thing. She'd always say, stick to what's under your nose. 
Um, and, and probably the biggest mistakes we made were trying to extend businesses in, in weird ways. So one example I can give you in the, uh, the video business, uh, we reached a point where um, you know, we had 150 people, we had our own production studios, we were the biggest distributor oh, wow. in the world for educational videos. So I was looking for new ways to grow. Um, and this was uh, just in the very early days of Amazon. And so we took kind of a tangent and put together a catalog, in essence, of videos for consumers. It made perfect sense to me. There's a lot of smart people in the world be interested in educational kinds of films at home. Lynda.com, um, before, before that's right. that business. That's right, very early on. Um, unfortunately, I was terribly wrong, or I didn't do it nearly as well as Linda did. Uh, <laughs> and we lost a good chunk of money on that idea. So, um, you know, it's again one of those things where you, best intentions, intuition seemed right. Uh, it was clearly a mistake. You recognize it early, you cut it off, right. um, and move on. And it's just, just a big part of uh, bootstrapping and, you know, kind of being your own, own judge along the way. Yeah, I think it's like not being dogmatic about decisions. I think we, we did a lot of things wrong the company that we sold to Citrix with those products, but I don't think that anyone was dogmatic. I think at the end of the day, we were all willing to seek the truth together yeah. and acknowledge when we found the truth as opposed to, well, that's counter to my opinion or my idea or whatever. So there wasn't a whole lot of my idea, your idea. It was like, let's, let's find the, the answer. And again, that's a healthy culture when you can create that culture within your company where people, it's not about making someone else wrong or making yourself right. It's about finding the right answer and executing on it as quickly as you can. Absolutely. We'll take the next student. Yeah. So. Um, Right Signature has a mobile version, which to my understanding is more of a supplement to the, to the rest of the software. Um, my question is, would your advice to an entrepreneur developing a SaaS product be to go to desktop first, or if you think you have something that could work really well on mobile, given how flooded the mobile market is, would you suggest going to mobile first? So fit your product to your market. Yeah. S simple end of the day, right? There are certain businesses, in fact, I love right now a verticalized SaaS. Uh, we have a couple great ones in town that do you know, property management and construction and there's a bunch of other ones out there I'm looking at. Um, I love the, the model, for example, of providing SaaS for um, kind of mobile small businesses. So your plumber, electrician, for example, market hasn't been done well yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's a mobile market, obviously, right? Those types of professionals are running around all day long. It, they're going to be on a mobile device. Uh, if you're making something for accountants or people that sit at their desk all day, it, you know, uh, mobile, is, mobile is not the gospel. So really, you need to fit it to the market. In our business at Right Signature, mobile is mostly used by what we call our signers. So Right Signature had a magical piece of the model um, that I'll share with you that if you can find it is a little bit of a holy grail. So with Right Signature, like GoToMeeting, um, our customer is a small business, right? That small business has a bunch of documents to get signed. Maybe they need every new client to fill out a form and sign it. They're going to send a document to a lot of people every month. So for us, every customer potentially introduces Right Signature to 100 new customers a month, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000 for our big users, right? So there's a virality to the business, which is really important. For us, mobile is really cool for the signers. So if you're receiving a document, you want to be able to fill it out, quickly sign it uh, on mobile. And that's really where we, where we put our focus. Um, that, that element of virality, though, it's one of those really cool guerrilla bootstrapping things. And yeah. if you can find a business like that that will propel itself, um, perpetuate itself, that's, that's a magical element for a startup. You're doing a great job of anticipating my questions because my next question is about grill marketing. So okay. I had the pleasure, I invited Daryl to speak at a, we had a, a CEO summit a number of years ago and Daryl came in and talked about the, some of the online tactics and strategies he deployed to bring in customers. Brilliant, I really wish we had videotaped that. It was just, it was in, impeccably done. Um, so I'm curious as to what, so I know you've got the tactical side down. Did you pull off any guerrilla marketing or any sort of one-time stunnish type things that help give you a spurt of growth? I don't know if it was a, a stunt, but we took advantage really early on. You know, it was just a handful of us sitting down uh, in an office on State Street here in, in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, we, we were thinking, how do we create right signature and make right signature as a brand look as big as our larger competitors yep, yep. Uh, online, right? To, to, to consumers coming into a space or new buyers. They don't have any clue who the, who the big players, the small players are. And we, as a startup, we were thinking, you know, how do we establish this, this credibility? Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have the money. Um, we didn't have the, the, the only so much time in the day. And we uh, identified a strategy to, in essence, use other SaaS companies to get the word out for us. So we looked at companies like FreshBooks, uh, wow. you know, companies like uh, Salesforce and a bunch of other CRMs. Um, and thought, these are the drop boxes of the world. These are companies that already have the customer base that we want. Uh, and if I can get friendly with those guys and have them put right signature on their website in any way, shape, or form, um, <laughs> we would be getting to the right audience, right? They've already done the hard work of 
finding the small businesses out there that want to use SaaS software. Yep. Um, so we just needed to get Right Signature's name in front of them. So I spent a lot of time, uh, Gorilla on the road, meeting founders of those companies, lots of happy hours, bought a few drinks, lots of coffees, um, and figuring out are there ways to partner with those companies. In some cases, it was integration. So mm -hmm. Right Signature mm -hmm. partnered through integration, and they would feature it. Um, other, a lot of them just felt it was a good fit. You know, mm -hmm. Right Signature's a great product. You serve small businesses. We serve small businesses. Uh, we'll write a blog article about you. Mm -hmm. um, and nice. we did a lot of that for many, many many years. We got a lot of exposure to the right audience by letting other people do the tough work for us. So because the other two primary players were selling up market to the enterprise, that opened that up for you so that Correct. like for FreshBooks, for instance, you would be the logical partner, not somebody that's selling to a much larger organization. That's right. I'm a huge fan of partnerships. Sometimes I actually err on the side of force fitting them into deals mm -hmm. when they don't make sense just because I, I like them so much and I've seen the value of them. But again, be careful that you don't take a strategy, right, that worked for Daryl or worked for me at, at some of my uh, past companies and force feed it because it doesn't always work. There are, there are certain situations where partnering is not going to net the amount of uh, return that it will for your time. I mean, Correct. the time that it takes to, because you said you had a lot of dead ends, a lot of coffees, a lot of drinks. That's how partnerships happen. They don't happen on a couple of emails. That's it's, right. it's relationship building, which doesn't happen overnight. And speaking of relationships, and then I'll go to the next student question. You ended up were acquired by Citrix. Great, uh, my alma mater, I love that company. I love Mark Templeton. He's, he's built an incredible organization. Obviously they're here in Santa Barbara, but what led to that, what led to that acquisition? Were you guys partners first? What was sort of the story there? What so it started as, as an integration partnership. Okay. So they were one of um, 40 some partners that we had um, that integrated right signature with their product. Citrix has a great product called ShareFile, yep. uh, which is a file storage product, extremely popular. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 50,000 some uh, customers. And uh, you know, talking with, with those folks, they said, you know, our customers ask for each signature every day. Mm, Again, looked nice. at the products in the market. Um, they love the right signature product. Uh, we spent a lot of time together, lots of coffees together, yep. struck an integration partnership initially. Their customers started to take it, were very uh, happy and successful with the product and the integration, um, and the relationship grew from there. So I think it's uh, also from an investor's point of view, you know, it's very, very rare that you have an acquisition that comes out of the blue. You'll read about yeah. it occasionally in the news, um, right. but it's a lottery ticket. Yep. A large majority of acquisitions are built out of relationship yep. uh, and partnership, and acquisitions are magic. Like everything has to come together. I've been lucky enough to have two acquisitions and an IPO uh, in my career, uh, it takes a lot of luck uh, among, among other things, but mm -hmm. you really have to have the pieces come together. So yeah. in the case of Citrix, there was great synergy between these two products and the way we were going to market. Um, our company was at the right size and stage that it made, made sense for Citrix. Citrix was at the right size and stage strategically. Right. Um, a lot of magic has to happen and the people have to like each other. The teams have to fit. We had built a great team here in Santa Barbara. Yep. Um, it, you know, there were parts of, of uh, all aspects of the deal you know, really have to come together for, for an acquisition to make sense. And it's so true. Most acquisitions don't happen. So yep. I get, you know, I've got now 25 some companies mm -hmm. that we're involved with and they get approached all the time. I mean, it's not uncommon, right, for people to put feelers out. Um, it, it is uncommon for, for those feelers to then result in, you know, cash in the bank. Absolutely. So. We, we had probably half a dozen um, approaches sure. uh, since over the years, um, in the five or so years we were running the business. Um, you know, to us, acquisition is not the end game. Right. We were really trying to build a company that I'd be willing to run and own for the rest of my life. I um, mean, you have to go into it with, with that outlook because right. A, it's got to be fun every day. You don't want to be running a business for something you're not passionate about. Uh, and B, you'll make the right decisions. You're going to make the right long-term decisions. You're not right. you know, trying to hit a short goal of right. after we get acquired next year, if that conversation with that happen. one partner it doesn't happen, it drags on. Right. It's very typical, especially in the tech business. So you've got to make the right decisions to own the company forever. Um, and when the right deal comes together, you know, part of it is that legacy, right? You've done a lot of good, right? Signature has created a lot of jobs in this community. We you know, support families. We support small businesses. There's a lot of positivity it comes out of running a business, which mm -hmm. is my favorite part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at an acquisition, you say, you know, potentially could this larger company, and there's always a little bit of fear when you look at the big company, especially as a small guy, you know, Absolutely. could this, this, this huge company help us kind of expand the good things that we're doing in the world? Right. Uh, in the case of Citrix, a great company, great culture, great people. Um, and they've got tremendous experience taking products like GoToMeeting and just blowing the distribution worldwide. So we were at a stage where we had this great product, we had a nice customer base, we had a good brand name, but you know, we had just scratched the surface mm -hmm. uh, in this title change of you know, people moving away from paper to, uh, to electronic. And so we go with Citrix, we can kind of expand the vision, the legacy of what we've done, and the distribution you know, obviously just goes exponential. Yep, well, it's kind of ironic that they're here in Santa Barbara, the, the, the main company, mm -hmm. Uh, that does the online business, but your main partner was on the other coast, 
uh, yes. North Carolina or yes. North Carolina, yeah. Somewhat uh, coincidental that uh, we were right. down, down the street right. there. But it had to help that there was some mutual, mutual um, connections here. But I want to touch back on, and then I'm going to get the next student question, on competition. So some students will say, John, I don't really have competition. I'm the first in the industry to do this. You had competition. Let's say EchoSign didn't exist, DocuSign didn't exist. Your biggest competition, you mentioned it a couple times. Yeah, competition is paper. Pen and, pen and paper. That's correct. And that's how it is for most entrepreneurs. So when we did um, robotic surgery, mm -hmm. our competition wasn't, there was one other company. Our competition was an intuitive surgical. We were actually in it together to yep. get surgeons to use robotics in the, in the OR mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to slug it out with them. We were both trying to educate the market and say, hey, it's safe. It's better outcomes. The efficacy rates are higher. So we actually were aligned in that regard. We certainly were fierce competitors, but we were definitely aligned in trying to educate the, the world. So whenever you think you don't have competition, think again, because whatever came before you, that is your competition. Whatever the substitute for what you're providing is, that is your competition. Correct, and I think it's particularly in technology, you very rarely find a market where all the customers are using some technology already, because right. it's just not the nature of technology. Probably for the next 50 years for all of your careers, <laughs> most technology spaces, the large majority of customers aren't using anything. But for those of you that are interested in not going into technology, you know, there's great opportunities in run-of-the-mill stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, before Blue Bottle came along, you know, there was Starbucks. Before Starbucks, there was Pete's. I mean, it's not as if people weren't drinking coffee. Before but that, there was Maxwell House. That's right. There's always always opportunity something. to do something better, um, right. you know, do a more refined version of the product, do it yeah. for a specific niche, and it's true of almost any space. You can just always do it better. And in fact, the older the competitors are in a space, I'd say the yeah. greater the opportunity to yep. come in and kind of eat their lunch. Yep. Yeah. So be like Daryl, get invigorated when you see competitors mm -hmm. don't become deflated because they're always going to have some form of competition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for being here, by the way. Um, I have a kind of a two-part question, one involving myself and one my um, children. Um, having started a company at 12 years old, and many entrepreneurs also say that they've been bitten early by that bug. Do you think that's something you're born with or something you would evolve into? And the second part is that, how would you encourage that in children? So uh, I often get the question, are entrepreneurs born or made? And I think the, the clear answer is both. Um, I was absolutely born. I came out of the womb starting businesses, uh, very unusual. Um, but, but you absolutely can be born. I also think it can be learned. Um, and I, in fact, there are plenty of entrepreneurs that you know, were clearly born entrepreneurs, start, started starting businesses very early, and, and haven't been successful for a variety of reasons because they didn't have the, the learnings applied uh, on it. You know, I, I was kind of always a self-learner, but not everybody is. On the same note, I think um, there's tremendous resources. You've got incredible teachers like John and, and so much available online and so much learning from the startup community. We're in like an unprecedented era for all of you that say, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start companies. There is no better time in history than the moment you're in right now. There's so much learning out there. There's, you know, all the stuff that I had to muddle through, the money I wasted, the <laughs> hours and the years and the bad decisions and the heartache. You can avoid a lot of that stuff by learning. And that, you know, that stuff didn't exist 10 years ago. It didn't exist 20 years ago. So, yeah. um, you know, then when you look from a technological point of view, the stuff like AWS and the tools that are available right now to launch companies, um, you know, with, with either, you know, no capital or, you know, low assets, the ability to learn programming, which didn't even exist, you know, a handful right. of years ago. Right. Um, I mean, you are in the best era if you're really determined to teach yourself this stuff and to do something successful, you know, in the near term. Um, I think the one big takeaway from, you know, my life starting early is that, that uh, you also have to be careful not to wait too long, right? There are opportunities that come by every day, um, and sometimes good ones, you know, practically hit you in the face. Um, for me, I've always kind of, you know, moved earlier rather than later. Um, you know, chosen the, the opportunities very carefully. I wait for the right ones, but when they're right, you kind of kind of throw everything else in, you know, out in your life and, and focus and, and grab those opportunities no matter what age you're at. You know, I don't care whether you're still in school. I don't care whether you're in grad school or you're working for a company or whatever it is. You know, if you've got that entrepreneurial bug, you got to watch for the opportunities and when they come, you, you know, you have to jump on them quickly. Yep. Yeah. I get the question in office hours, um, and the details always differ, but the, the question ends up being, should I wait or should I do it? You know, or should I do it now? Mm -hmm. And I, my answer is always don't wait. Like, yep. never wait. It's like yep. waiting almost never pays off That's for right. you. So, yep. you know, get in, and if it's not the right opportunity, then, then make an adjustment. But waiting will net you nothing in the world of entrepreneurship, other than heartache. You mentioned that um, you, your company uh, benefited from DocuSign and, and other competitors paving the way. Is this something that you had planned to take advantage of, or did you notice this in hindsight? Um, I, I did plan on entering the space. I mean, when we entered the space, we clearly knew we had competitors. Um, frankly, 
at that particular stage of life that I was in, I probably would not have entered the space had it been completely greenfield. Had we had to invent it, um, I love Santa Barbara too much. I like my walks on the beach. Uh, I don't think I had it in me to, you know, do the hundreds of millions of dollars of raise to build, you know, hundreds or thousands of employees and create a space out of thin air. Um, I have huge respect for people that, uh, you know, that, that want to do that. So for me, it was a very clear and conscious decision to choose a space uh, that had lots of room. And that's almost always true right now in technology. You know, it's a big world out there. There's a lot of customers and there's always a niche. So, you know, if you spot something out there that looks appealing, there's almost always an adjacent space you can find or a way to come in with a slightly different product or you know the blue bottle cup of coffee against the Starbucks. There's always a way to position a competitor if you find a space that you're really passionate about. We'll take the um, next student question. Oh, okay. So you briefly mentioned Y Combinator at the beginning of the interview. Um, what is your take on the importance of like a seed accelerator? And for young entrepreneurs, would you suggest looking into like an incubator? Um, to get started off. Yeah, absolutely. I think incubators are incredible, as are all educational resources. Um, you know, incubators are really about learning and, and networking. I don't think they're critical by any means. I think that's another one of these sort of uh, the cult of Silicon Valley. Uh, one reason I love living in Santa Barbara, the, you know, the cult of Silicon Valley is everybody's got to go into an incubator and then everybody's got to raise a Series A. Uh, it's absolutely not true. But uh, the res educational resources are great. So if you don't have you know, the, the network or the advisors or the kind of learning that you feel like you need to start the business, absolutely, it's a, it's a great path, but absolutely not critical. You know, if you've got the right idea, motivation, the time to, to pursue it now, you don't need to wait. You don't need to wait for people to support you, people to validate your idea, investors to validate it with checks. A um, you know, large majority of businesses in the world are started without any of that. Yeah, again, I think it's not one size fits all. We have the Galita Entrepreneurial Magnet here in Santa Barbara, which we're all very proud of, and actually was cited last year, or national publication as, as, a, as a leading um, incubator. But it's not gonna be a good fit for everyone. And I think the reason incubators has been a backslash, back, backlash against them is because too many companies went in that weren't a good fit for the incubator yeah. model. So again, one size does not fit all. So getting back to the acquisition, um, are there, were there lessons that you think a young first-time entrepreneur could take away from your exit, either the way it went down, the way it was negotiated, things you would have done differently, anything that would be helpful to someone on the beginning of their career looking many years out to their exit? So exits are magical. Um, that's probably the better definition of the word unicorn. Uh, extremely rare when they come together well. <laughs> right. Um, you know, for me, you really want to choose a business that you're willing to run for life. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start a company, you got to find something you're passionate about. You know, if you're making software for gardeners and you're not passionate about gardening, you got a problem. Yep. Um, and I actually take fault with some of the market validation kind of uh, theory around, you know, find a market and validate it. And if there's a great business opportunity, go for it. Uh, if you're a really cold, unemotional person, that can work really well for you. For the <laughs> large majority you're of us. You're probably not an entrepreneur. That's right. So uh, you, you've got to find something that you love and that you feel like you could do for the next you know, yeah. 25, 30. What, you know, what if you end up uh, owning a successful business that takes off and no exit yeah. transpires, which frankly is the case for you know, a large majority of VC-backed companies too, yeah. including successful ones. Just because you built a successful business does not mean there's somebody there to buy it. And there's right. not mean there's somebody there to buy it for a price that, that makes sense. And there's not, doesn't mean that all that magic's gonna come together. They're gonna like your team and vice versa. Um, so, you know, you really have to, to, from the very beginning, find an idea you're incredibly passionate about that you are willing to run for the rest of your life. And when you get into it, uh, and you're building that company to be your lifetime career, um, often magic happens, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. when you pull together the right people because, hey, you're in this forever. You're only going to bring people on for the ride that you really like to be around, right. uh, that are big contributors. Yep. Um, you're going to make the kinds of decisions that make sense for the long term for building that business for the security of the, of the business long term. So, um, you know, it, it's really about long term thinking and not designing designing for exit. Yeah, designing yeah. for exit is like planning your life around winning the lottery. Right, yeah. right, or, or yes, it's almost like thinking about who you're gonna marry five years beforehand and then having it all mapped out. Good luck, it's probably Correct. not gonna happen. Correct. Uh, Mark Suster set up here earlier uh, this quarter and um, celebrated entrepreneur and investor and an overlay that, that I would apply to what you just said from something he said is absolutely do the, pa you know, passion has gotta be key, but make sure it's something that you're better at than most people. So, and you're clearly very, very good at what you do. You're very, very good at generating interest online. You're very, very good at, you know, click, trial, buy um, type businesses. Um, that's the other place where you have to be really honest with yourself as a young person, be self-aware. Um, you, you can be passionate about something and not be that great at it. That's okay, but that may not be what you want to bank, you know, the next five years of your life trying to uh, pull off. So I have um, a question about Citrix today, and actually there was a huge announcement today about um, Citrix, public company, 
so this is all public information. Um, they're spinning out their go-to division, which would be go to meeting, go to webinar, go to training, et cetera, go to assist, and that's gonna become a separate public company. So that's gonna have an impact on Daryl. It's gonna have an impact on your employees and on Right Signature. I'd love to hear whatever thoughts you wanna share about that, but then even beyond that, now that you're on the inside, you've been this wild ro roaming entrepreneur your whole life. What, um, what adjustments are you making in becoming an entrepreneur? Like you're still innovating, you haven't given that up, but how has that changed now that you're within the confines of a bigger organization? So I, w I won't speak to the detailed news today, but uh, in terms of working for a big company, life-changing, totally different experience. This is the yep. first time in my life I've ever had a job. Uh, it's not always pleasant, uh, but it's a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous learning experience. Um, so you know, seeing how big companies operate is just a completely different universe. Yep. Uh, different language, different lingo, uh, different speed, different way of making decisions. Um, that's fascinating. You know, it's a little bit like being in a zoo sometimes. Yeah, I just yeah. walk around with my jaw open. Um, but I'm learning, you know, so much about how big organizations work. Uh, really, really fascinating learning experience. So, you know, as we take Right Signature, which is this small product, small team, um, and work it into this bigger company, we're finding that a lot of our team that we're doing very day-to-day -day kind of tactical things, uh, answering phones, right, right, writing code, yep. all of a sudden we're functioning a little bit more strategically, right? Now we have mm. this huge worldwide company that's distributing our product at a breathtaking pace, and we're able to really focus on the big stuff. So um, it's a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy. You know, we as a small company, your your survival, the, the survival, uh, yeah. everyday issues. As you get into a big company, we can really focus on best product, best market fit, and we have this huge company to do. Um, you know, some of the some of the big heavy lifting. So mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating to see the power of big companies. Um, I think from an entrepreneur's point of view, it's also really important to, as you're choosing businesses, to understand that big companies, if they fire your cannon your way, you better duck. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's really important. I always advise people you know, starting software companies, don't ever do anything that's in the path of Google. Mm. Very, very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and being inside of It used of big, to be Microsoft. It, it used to be. But any of, these, you know, any of these really muscular companies, if they're going to point a cannon your way, you're, you're, you're in trouble. And being on the inside of a big company, you can see why. Because right. the, the resources, the distribution are just tremendous. Um, so it, it really comes back to you know, choosing small business models. I think you can learn a lot from that. You want to find things that, uh, from maybe an exit point of view, have some potential to be synergistic or appealing to a big company, but not yeah. so obvious out of the gate that you know, the month after you start it, right. Twitter or Google is going to turn their cannon uh, right. your direction. Right, yeah. yeah, stay under the radar. I mean, at Microsoft, people kept saying they're going to take you out, they're going to take you mm -hmm. out, because they had a meeting product. Yeah. It just wasn't very good, and, and more importantly, it wasn't their focus. Yeah. Like they, that meeting just was a, a little add-on to their office solution, and they never focused on it. And luckily, they never took us out. So I, I think Citrix is a very well-run company. I didn't stay that long, and Mark Tippleton knew that I wasn't going to stay, and, and then all, um, we all left on good terms. But one thing that I found, I really had to manage the meetings. Like, they would want me to go to 25 meetings a week. And I would literally say, guys, that's all I would do. Like, I'll go from one to the other to the other to the other. And I'm a doer like you. Like, I want to roll up my shirt sleeves and close deals and get things done and drive the cash register. And that, for me, would have been the big challenge if I had stayed. Like, how do I balance attending the meetings that matter and ringing the cash register and keeping myself my sanity. Mm -hmm. um, I never I never figured that out because I left uh, to do something else. But maybe you'll hopefully you'll figure that out. <laughs> so last question for you. A lot of these students in here um, would like to stay in Santa Barbara. Um, there was a big article written a couple weeks ago about Techtopia. It's a wonderful article. It cited 80 companies here in Santa Barbara that are all legitimate tech startups. You were included. In fact, you were highlighted. Um, do you have any sort of parting words for, for students that might be thinking, hey, I came to Santa Barbara for the surf and for the school, but I didn't realize maybe there's a longer term opportunity for me here? Yeah, so personally, I think Santa Barbara is probably the best place in the universe at the moment to, to do technology. Um, you've got the combination, of course, of a, of a great life. Um, but personally, I'm not a huge fan of the cult of Silicon Valley. Me either. Um, you know, I think that having some distance from the yep. cult yep. Um, gives you the ability to make some really good decisions. And uh, I think for bootstrap companies, it's fantastic. We've got a bunch of great small companies in town. Uh, if you want to go work for one, Right Signature's hiring if you're interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but if you want to start something, you know, having that distance from the kind of uh, incubator, VC, path and kind of cult and expectations, I think makes a, a ton of sense. Daryl, thank you so much. Thank you.